Well, Conan O'Brien, this Cuba episode you did a few months ago, of all the things you've done on television over the years, where would that rank for you? It's pretty high up there, uh, I would have to say. I've had some great moments. We did a show where I uh, went to Finland, where I'm a national hero and uh, transformed that nation, and I think Europe in general. Uh, I got them uh, on the Euro, so uh, that was a big deal for me. But the Cuba special, the Cuba episode was very important to me because I always like it when our show changes. I've been doing this a long time. It's hard to believe, but I'm now the old guy on late night. I've been doing it for 22 years. And so the only way to keep doing it is to keep challenging ourselves and do things that maybe we couldn't have done two, three, four, five years ago. So the Cuba show, I think, is right up there with one of my favorite things I've ever done on television. Well, it was a real uh, guerrilla effort. I mean, uh, it looked like it was just you and maybe the camera, a couple of camera guys and maybe a producer or two. I mean, it was, was it like you took a big crew over there or, or a lot? It of was very, it was very guerrilla. We decided we had the idea. It would be great to be, uh, to do a, to broadcast a late night show from Cuba. And we realized that no one had done it since Jack Parr had taken The Tonight Show to Cuba in around 1960 or 61, and that was before the embargo. And we thought, well, gee, no one's been there really pretty much for more than my lifetime. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we could go back? And wouldn't it be great if instead of me interviewing celebrities while I'm in Cuba and just doing a show from Cuba, if we went and I jumped in and I became part of the culture and met the people and really tried to make friends. And so we went uh, very quickly. Uh, we prepared. We found a producer out of Vancouver who had done some work with European companies in Cuba. And he said, I could help you get in. Uh, we didn't quite go in the legitimate way. We didn't have working papers. We didn't have visas. Uh, we got stopped at the airport. Uh, we almost didn't get in. And then we got in. And once we were in, we decided let's shoot pretty much 24 hours a day, every day for four days, because we never knew when we were going to be asked to leave. And no one ever stopped us from shooting anything. No one ever approached us. Uh, shockingly, it was easier to shoot in a communist country that is embargoed by the United States than it is in Manhattan. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Well, you did have one shutdown there, on at least that we saw, where, where you were in the store. Yes, we were in the store, and the guy got very nervous. We blurred his face because a big part of this is I didn't want to get anyone, any of the Cuban people in trouble. You know, the, the uh, very much the thrust of this was, can I do improvisational comedy uh, in a country that we have not been friendly with for more than 50 years? Can I go there and do improvisational comedy and make them laugh? But I don't want to, I don't want them to be the butt of the joke. I want the joke to be on me, that I'm unfamiliar with the culture. I can't sing. I'm an idiotic dancer. I get drunk on the rum. I wanted them to be in the authority position uh, because I thought that was the appropriate tone that I should go in with, which is with humility. So we didn't want to get anyone in trouble and that storekeeper it's not that we got thrown out but he was getting very nervous and he said i need to call someone and we thought you know what if he has to do that he's going to get in trouble so let's blur his face and let's leave well the reviews i read and i hope you take this the right way uh, it sounds like you would um say nobody nobody in show business plays the american idiot better than conan you know what thank you uh that's something my mother said. Please, please the American. No, no, I, I, um, I really, it's a kind of comedy that I really like, that I'm very fond of. And I did take it as a high compliment because the American idiot abroad is really, I mean, it's an invention. Mark Twain uh, was, was doing that kind of humor in the 19th century. The, uh, the American being out of place and out of sorts and out of his element uh, and being the butt of the joke uh, has been, it's part of a long, rich American tradition of humor. And I also think when you're a country that's as rich as our country and is as powerful as our country, when 
when you send someone like me there who is not afraid to look silly and not afraid for the joke to be on me, it's actually a sweet message. It's actually kind of in a weird way. I didn't intend it that way, but it almost feels like a form of diplomacy that I'm not going there to make fun of them or be the person who's the authority figure. I'm going there so that they can laugh at my attempt to dance, laugh at my attempt to sing, laugh at my inability to hold my rum. Uh, that's, you know, laugh at my uh, inability to make a Cuban cigar. And there was a lot of affection. Uh, it was tone wise, it was one of my favorite things that I've ever done. So you didn't feel like they were laughing at you, but with you? Or no, I did feel they were laughing at me. <laughs> I want to be clear about that. I do think, I think they were laughing with me. And then I think there were times where they were definitely laughing at this very strange, tall, skinny man with orange hair in a white suit uh, who's dancing around like a fool. But I thought uh, what, I, what I got from the people was a lot of affection. They're very much interested in uh, normalizing relations with the United States. They want this to happen. They're eager for it. They need it. Uh, they, they want the business. Uh, they understand that it's going to change their culture, but they very much want us to be friends again. And I thought it's such a comp there's so many complicated issues between our two countries, but when you can use humor and approach them in a very human way, all of that drifts in the background momentarily. So I thought that was really nice. Did you feel like any people knew who you were or many people or, or, or I know you said maybe some of the tourists. Yes, we have, it eventually leaked out because there were some European tourists. South Americans know who I am. And so South Americans in certain countries that were visiting Cuba would want my, they would want a selfie with me. The selfie now is universal. Uh, I, I honestly believe if, if uh, alien life came to Earth tomorrow, their first thing they would ask for is a selfie. Everybody does it. So yes, the selfie was, I was taking those with a lot of South American tourists. That's how it got out. There are also European tourists that know that I am who I am and they were asking for selfies. And then occasionally there'd be an American tourist. Um, and they all looked like they were on the lam. <laughs> the, American, the American tourists in Cuba look like they're running from something and have been for a while. They didn't uh, know the, uh, the relationship had gotten better. They were hiding out. Yeah, they're hiding out. And they would be like, Conan, I want a picture, man. And they would have, you know, a machete tied to their leg. And they're wearing a, a, a T-shirt that looks like it's 30 years old. So, uh, but they're all, and then there's a lot of Canadians there as well. A lot of pictures with Canadians. Speaking of photos, I loved one I saw last week when you were at the Steve Martin uh, AFI tribute. I saw one photo with, it was Steve Carell, and then you, and then Brad Garrett. And I thought, I bet Conan doesn't look up to too many people. No, no. Like Brad Garrett. Right. Uh, Brad Garrett is, uh, I'm very tall. And then Brad Garrett is, he needs to go to the doctor tall. He's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's I, wanna, I want his pituitary looked at. I'm worried about him medically, but uh, yeah, it was nice. It was it was nice to be at that event. I mean, uh, all of us backstage, Tina Fey, uh, Steve Carell, uh, we were all talking backstage about how there's no one that our generation holds in higher esteem probably than Steve Martin. So that was an intimidating event to be invited to attend, but it ended up being really fun. Well, you were there, I guess, this year, and then you were there a couple of years ago for the Mel Brooks event. Yeah, I was there for Mel Brooks, yeah. And I'm just, now, I, now I'm determined to get into film so I can have one of those dinners. I need to do, I think, two cameos in movies, and then I think I can have an AFI dinner. Yeah, I think these days, if you can sell enough tables, you can have an AFI dinner. Okay, well, I'm going to start working on that right away. <laughs> well, back to Cuba. Uh, I want to spend, I mean, I, I really feel like this could be your pathway back into some more Emmy nominations this year. I, I, I hope yeah. that's what you're submitting. Yeah, that we uh, definitely that's what we're submitting. And I think what felt great about it is that it felt like a real discovery that I've been shooting remotes for a long time and people have always loved them. And it felt like, well, wait a minute, we can ramp these up and it's a muscle I have and I've developed a style and a tone over the, over the years of doing these remotes that uh, seems to be very popular. And now with the internet, these things 
just seem to go everywhere, which is really fun. Uh, a, a bunch of the, anytime I get out of the studio, people seem to really like it. And then when you add the cultural element of going to a different country and seeing me in these different air, lands, that was, I think, a discovery that, wait a minute, we've sort of played a little bit with this before with Finland and with Ireland, but we could really take this up a notch and make this more regular part of our show. And what if you did a hybrid where it's Conan O'Brien mixed with Anthony Bourdain, you know, uh, mixed with, uh, you know, Anderson Cooper, but then really, really mostly Conan, because those guys, they don't make me laugh. Well, where would you see yourself? I mean, I'm sure internally you're talking about maybe uh, another yes. another We're possibility. About all kinds of places. I'm definitely, it's hard to recreate the magic of Cuba because that is such a window of time that may already be closing. Between, you know, uh, President Obama announced uh, at the beginning of the year that we were going to relax and try and improve our relations with the Cuban people. That's when we decided let's make this happen quickly. Let's do it because I think people are going to be broadcasting from Cuba left and right. Once the view is in Cuba, we know the fun is over. I'll be honest with you. So uh, we've got to, we've got, and they're going to do a Cuba, a bachelor from Cuba. So I need to move on. I need to move on and find other places that, that fascinate me where I feel that maybe I would, you know, what are the countries that just make you laugh when you think of Conan going there and you just start laughing right away? Those are the places we, I don't want to give anything away, but that's that's kind of what we're interested in doing. Well, come visit us here in Mississippi. I think I could take you some places you would be very surprised. I love Mississippi. You know, I studied uh, Faulkner. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors and I studied Faulkner and I drove once as a young man uh, to Oxford and saw his house and that just blew me away. Yeah, we've got that that nice combination of, of backwards kind of folks, but then you have a William Faulkner and a Tennessee Williams and an Oprah Winfrey and a BB King and an Elvis Presley. So, well, I'll be honest. Interesting. I'm from Massachusetts, and we have plenty of our own backwards folks. There's you you guys don't have. <laughs> there's no state that doesn't have its share of backwards folks. I've got some in my family. <laughs> in fact, I may be one of them. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Depending on who you're talking to. Um, you, you shot four days. I mean, we only had that one hour show. Was there yeah. a lot more material that might, might there was, seen? but we always boil it down to what are the best moments. And I think that's what made the show such a success. And, uh, I was very, I like, I think editing is such an important, important part of the creative process that we had a lot of extra footage, but you take it out for a reason. And, uh, so I'm a big believer in, yes, there are some moments that we had that were pretty good that we didn't shoot, but I think you saw everything that I thought was special and worthy of being on television. Well, we mentioned the Emmys a moment ago. You've got three of them, uh, the most recent for interactive uh, mm -hmm. programming, your, your Team Coco, which I think, was it Tom Hanks that came up with that name? Yeah, Tom, Tom Hanks uh, came up with the Coco, and unfortunately it stuck. When, when, it, when a star of the caliber of Tom Hanks nicknames you, there's nothing you can do about it. So at the time, he, got, he came on my show and he got the crowd chanting, Co, 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 and then it took off. And then when I went through you know, some of my transitional madness, that's, and it became a grassroots movement, that's what people seized on. And now I'm, I think it's going to say that on my gravestone. <laughs> the, the, he doesn't he get, uh, yeah. he does get a claim on uh, part of that Emmy, though. He has enough awards. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't. I'm not feeling too bad for Tom Hanks right now. It's about time that guy caught a break. Well, Andy Samberg hosts this year's Emmys. You've hosted them a couple of times. You've hosted other shows, mm -hmm. uh, and you know you both had that SNL past. Yep. What uh, What advice would you give him about hosting this year's Emmys? Oh, uh, wow. Well, Andy Samberg doesn't need any advice from me. He's he's hilarious and a really good guy. He's that rare combination of he's very talented and funny and likable and he's also in real life a nice person i don't get to say that too often uh and he's i think he's gonna do a great job my advice to him is do it really comes down to when you're doing comedy do the things that you that are going that you're going to enjoy doing if you enjoy doing if you come up with comedy bits that you're going to enjoy doing in that room it's going to go well never get stuck i was always on the lookout 
if something was being presented to me that didn't feel like it was something that I would enjoy or it didn't feel innovative or it didn't feel fun, I was very strong about saying I'm not doing that. And uh, so that would be my advice. Well, and with the today's social media and everything living on forever too, you've got to you got to think about do I want this to be seen forever? Right. Well, that, we could ask that same question right now. I don't feel my makeup for this was adequate, and this is going to live forever. Oh, you'll be fine. This, this won't be up for any awards or anything, but you'll be fine. It's trust me. Someone out there is taping this whole thing, and it's going to exist for all of time. And when Earth is gone. This is going to exist in the airwaves and space and aliens are going to watch this in like three millennium. So I hope the pressure's on. Yeah, you I have learned uh, from past experience. I can't delete these YouTube videos. They just are not deletable. Right. Yeah, don't worry about that. Not that I want to delete this one. But. There's some stuff out there on YouTube that I desperately want deleted. Uh, it involves me in a shower uh, with Al Roker. But we're going to do what we can to hope that no one finds it. Well, you mentioned earlier, you're now the dean of all late night talk show hosts. You've been doing it the longest. Uh, and, with, and by the way, I love the piece you did on David Letterman for oh, Earth in the Weekly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sure I that really. That dean. I don't know that I'm the dean. I think I'm the old tenured alcoholic professor who's, you know, a little disreputable and he's hanging around the campus and sometimes no one can find him. And his, uh, the students don't know where he is. And then they find him sleeping in some leaves in the quadrangle. I think that's my relationship now. Yeah, when I was in college, when I got to, uh, I was in band as well, and uh, shocker. And uh, there was this guy in band that had been there, I think, since my parents were in college at the same school. And I, I want to say he might be, still be playing in band there. Right. There's always that guy who doesn't leave because college was the high point of his life. And it's fun for a year or two. And then about 20 years later, they're still there. So that may be, I may not be the dean, I'm actually maybe a student who never left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the late night student who ne who graduated, but I'm hanging around the campus. Well, you've got 22 years in now. Dave uh, has set the record at 33. Do you think you could outlast that? I think that would be a mistake to even think about longevity. I. Uh, my main focus is do a, try and do a very good show every day and do this as long as it is exciting to me and I feel I have something to contribute. And the minute I feel I'm not able to do that, I don't want to inflict myself on people, so I would just quietly go away. But the idea of I'm going to see if I can break a record and go for 33 years, you know, if I wake up one day and realize I've been doing it that long, that's fine. But I definitely want to make the focus, am I doing a good show every day, and did I do a good show yesterday, and do I think I could do a good show tomorrow, and that will dictate how long I do this. Well, speaking of things living on forever, I was I, a couple of months ago found, I was looking at an old Tonight Show DVD, and Dave was asked some, something similar to that, to that by Johnny on one of his last appearances with Johnny, and, and he just laughed and laughed and said there was no way he was going to be on that long. Right, right. But then he winked at the camera. And said, I didn't I'll notice that. <laughs> yeah. If you look carefully, Dave winks at the camera and said, I'll beat you by three years, Johnny. Um, I thought it was off putting. But uh, yeah, I guess no one knows. It's whenever someone predicts what they're going to be doing in five years, there is no greater folly. You know, none of us know. And uh, my, my, I really do have a very strong uh, belief that. My job is to be grateful that I get to do a show today and try my hardest to make it entertaining and exciting and maybe discover something that I haven't discovered before. That's my job. And once that, it's like an Etch-a-Sketch. Once that show is done, I shake it and we start again. And uh, then we'll see. If I'm talking to you again in 15 years, that would be great. I might be talking to you, but I might be taking your pizza order. So... Or you know, vice versa. Yeah, exactly. Well, we don't know. We don't know. We might be working together, and that's going to be one good pizza shop. That would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Did you like Dave's finale? I loved it. I really did. It was um, emotional. It uh, unexpectedly, I didn't, you know, I, Dave 
Letterman uh, abhors uh, sentimentality. He just doesn't like sentimentality. And so on our show, when we talked about him, I was very careful not to be sentimental. To just And when I wrote about him to not be sentimental, because I knew that Dave doesn't really want sentimentality. When I was watching his last show, it was very hard not to feel nostalgic and not to feel sentimental and not to feel like something's changing in my life. This guy has been a part of my life and a part of the landscape since I was in high school. And now he's departing the scene. And, you know, I replaced him or I never, you can't replace him, but I took over for Dave in, in 93. And he's just been such a important creative figure in my life. And so his departing, watching that last show, I thought was I thought it was a terrific program, but it left me a little sad, which surprised me. You know, I, I, I didn't expect that it would creep up on me like that. The biggest surprise to me was when he started at the desk toward the end before Foo Fighters, and he, he started talking and he's you know was thanking all these. I thought I knew the Foo Fighters were still to come. I thought is he is he really wrapping up right now? I mean I didn't didn't expect that. Right. Might have been his way of, uh, I'm, I'm similar in that I hate a goodbye. I, I just hate a goodbye. When people want to say goodbye to me, I, I'm a little bit of a coward, you know, that way. I, and, and so maybe there was a part of Dave that didn't want, you know, wanted to leave, end the show, and then have the Foo Fighters play, but didn't want that last moment where he said something and then the screen went dark because that would have been difficult in some way, which I could imagine, um, you know, maybe emotionally difficult, very loaded. So um, it may not have been an accident, you know? I, I had the feeling that he had looked at, maybe recently looked at Johnny's last just to see, oh, I like this. I don't want to do that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure he put a lot of thought. No one's on television for 33 years without giving a lot of thought to their last program. So, but I loved seeing all those clips all those old clips and um very powerful to see uh what you know i use the word seismic with with dave a lot i really do think he he shifted the tectonic plates of comedy he, he it was a it was that big a change and so seeing all those clips was very powerful and um i was glad i was hoping that a lot of younger people who may not have been familiar with what Dave was up to in 1980, you know, from 1982 to 1988 or 89 or 90, I was hoping that they would see those clips. And uh, so I was glad they showed them. If I'll tell you and anybody watching, uh, there's a piece on Huffington Post yesterday by his executive producer, Barbara Gaines, who was the one responsible for putting together that clip package. And she talks about how that took months and they had to go through different tonal changes and they were trying to figure out what was the right way to put it together. They did a great job. I thought they nailed the clip packages. I mean, um, I, it's a very hard thing to do. It's funny because it reminds me that when I was at the AFI event uh, for Steve Martin just a few days ago, I was, I thought the clip packages were spectacular and, and they, it's so hard to sum up you cannot sum up a career like David Letterman's or even Steve Martin's. You, you can't sum them up. It's, it's impossible because there's so much good material. But I thought Dave's clip package was spectacular. And I, I thought, I thought uh, same thing with, with Steve Martin's, that when people put a lot of thought into it, they can really give you the flavor of what someone's work has meant over 30, 40 years. Well, listen, Conan, speaking of saying goodbye, we've got to do that now. Are you going to throw to the Foo Fighters now? No, this isn't my last interview. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but they're there with you. That's the important thing. That's where they're in the kitchen. We're, we're, we're figuring it out. Okay, well, it was very nice talking to you. I'm getting you that frame TV guide. Drew Shane is sending it to you today. Today. You, which which spot do you want me to cover up? Should Dave come down? Yeah, I think I think that Rolling Stone is that a Rolling Stone Friends cover behind you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's got to come down. That's right. Well, I'm interviewing Matthew Perry this Friday, so it needs to stay up like two more days. Yeah, two more days. But tell Matthew Perry that I 
I, I really don't think uh, it's got to shift. It can stay up, but it needs to shift. And I want to be right by, beneath the odd couple and Columbo. That's what I want. And that's what I'm going to get. I want the TV guide where you are howdy doody. That's the one I want. Oh, you don't want the one where I'm a sexy model leaning against a really cool Mustang? I don't remember that one. I didn't think you did. All right, I'll get you the howdy doody. Great. But listen, Kona, good luck on the Emmys. I hope you're back in there this time with, okay. with, the, show, with the writing staff and so forth. You know what? I've got, if not, I've got my health. <laughs> you're right. I'll talk to you later.